All righty, let's get going. This is everything that you want to know about the COVID vaccine. Um, my name is Dr. Val de Crowder. I've been an emergency medicine physician now for 30 years. Um, people call me Dr. V. Um, and I have treated patients um, across uh, four pandemics, two category five hurricanes, um, and one mass shooting. Um, this information that's in, contained in this webinar, um, the uh, original source documents are at askdrv.us. These presentations, but not the Q&A, are, um, are all taped and they're dated. So that way you can make sure that you're not listening to old information. Um, and uh, we will get started. Okay, the structure of the webinar is that uh, there'll be a slide presentation for the first 20 to 25 minutes. Um, followed by question and answer during the question and answer time. Anything that you actually um, have thought about or been wondering about, um, make sure to ask it and get it off your mind and let's get into a conversation about things. During the presentation, everyone's in listen mode only so that that way we can hear the whole presentation. Um, if you have a question, you can write it in the chat box or you can also write it in the Q&A. You can do that now. So if you have burning questions or things that you actually want to know and you know you want to know the answer to them, go ahead and start writing it in to the chat box or the Q&A. And I take uh, those written questions first. If we have time, we open up the line um, and allow some people to ask their questions live if there's time. All right. The intention of this webinar is to keep participants informed with COVID-19 science that will help them and their family stay healthy during the pandemic. The outcome of the webinar is that you're gonna be motivated to create or improve an action plan for yourself or your family. And some people are creating or improving an action plan for a school or for a union or for a church or for a business or for some organization. Let's look at where we are globally. Total cases uh, globally of COVID-19 is 105 million. 2.2 million people have lost their lives as a result of COVID-19 worldwide. In the United States, we are 4% of the worldwide population, but we've been roughly about 25 to 28% of all of the cases and 25, 28% of all the deaths. So we really have not done well with COVID-19. When you actually look at how we compare to other countries like Japan, Mexico, Canada, Germany, UK, this actually graphic actually shows you, and this only goes until December of last year. Uh, this graphic actually shows you how we actually compare um, to other industrialized countries. So let's talk about what's happening now. This is the most exciting thing that I've seen in the, in the news recently. Um, there's one other thing that is, is up there with it, but the White House is gonna send millions of vaccine doses to retail pharmacies. Now, as we have discussed, right now, you usually have to make appointments or get vaccinated through your public health departments. Public health departments do not have the reach of CVS, Walgreens, Rite Aid, Walmart, Costco, uh, Target, Giant, Safeway, all of those various pharmacies. When you look at retail pharmacies, we can probably push 100 million vaccines through our retail pharmacy structure in 30 days. I know the goal was 100 million vaccines in 100, in 100 days, but you can actually push 100 million vaccines through retail pharmacies in 30 days. So this is really, really, this is gonna make a dramatic difference um, in the next two to four weeks. Now, let's talk about what's been happening. We got the Super Bowl coming up. Patrick Mahoney, the quarterback of the Kansas City Chiefs, was about to get his hair cut when they found out that their barber was infected with COVID-19. One of the players said, I was in the chair while it happened, midstream, and I had to get out of the chair. So, you know, Dr. Fauci says, don't have any Super Bowl parties, don't go out to any restaurants, um, just have lay cool, lay low, and have Super Bowl at home so that you don't get infected during this big weekend that is coming up. But COVID-19 has even, uh, even impacted um, our, our 55th Super Bowl. 
Now, at Dodger Stadium, we had some anti-vaxxers in LA shut down the vaccination site over this past weekend. Um, so there's a lot of controversy and we wanna talk about that as well. If you, if you got some opinions, you again, put it in the chat and put it in the Q&A. All right, I wanna talk about why, why I am not flying because I get asked this question a lot. So I wanna actually go over why I'm not flying. So one is we put together a list of what all the airlines are doing. So while all the airlines basically require a mask, many of them, Frontier, Spirit, and Sun Country, do not have masks available. Even more shocking, are there some airlines that are not cleaning the airplane before every flight? Again, Allegiant, Spirit, and Sun Country. Now, we also started documenting which airlines are actually selling the middle seat and which airlines are holding the middle seat. Right now, every single airline except for Delta, that is a domestic airliner that we have on this list, only Delta is holding the middle seat. So if you fly, you can get on a flight and it will be cramped and full. Now, in addition to that, and I don't necessarily agree with this, but Biden actually is gonna allow a mandate that allows people not to fly with a mask for medical exemptions. I'm not exactly sure what the medical exemptions would be to not have a mask. We use masks all the time on patients, even when they come in short of breath. Now, in order to qualify for this medical exemption, you have to have had a negative COVID test in the last three days. But we know from Canada, and this is Canada's uh, uh, information, starting January 7th, Canada said everyone who flies has to have a negative COVID test in the last three days. They had 70 flights that had one or more COVID positive patient on them. And some of them were international flights. Now COVID has a very, I mean, uh, Canada has a very robust public health system. So in the situation with Canada, um, they notify you, they make sure you get COVID tested. Um, it's very quick, it happens. You know, they notify you within 48 hours. Um, we do not do that in the United States. If you're on a flight with somebody who's COVID positive, you would not know. Um, and um, you may go on to infect family and friends. So that is why Dr. B is not flying. All right, now, as we always say, respect COVID-19, it is highly, highly contagious. So let's talk about how that's calculated. Minimum time to exposure and infect others is 45 seconds. Now. If you're talking about one of the uh, mutations, that can be down to 15 seconds. Then we also look at how many people out of 100, if 100 people were exposed to it, actually get COVID-19. COVID-19 is 60 to 80%. Some of the mutations is 80 to 90%. This is compared to the flu, which is 30 to 40. Now, let's talk about this. We've talked about it was droplet and it's also airborne. The droplets are larger. Airborne particles are smaller. COVID-19, we originally thought was a droplet disease. We now know that it's both. That's how come we originally had the recommendation of staying three feet from other people. Now we have the recommendation of staying five feet from people. So I wanna actually, or six feet, feet away from folks. So I wanna actually show what that looks like. So if this gentleman here had COVID-19, then the large red are the droplets. The gray, is the smaller gray or the airborne particles. Now, he could be talking, he could be shouting. Um, if he's singing, all of these particles are moving at about 200 miles per hour, right? If you think about a church or, you know, if you're at a funeral or if you're at a, a wedding or an event like that, that you should be going to now. Um, so these particles can go very, very far. And they also land on things, whether or not they're shoes, park benches, doors, et cetera, right? So now let's talk a little bit about COVID testing. Um, the PCR test is the gold standard. That is the test where it's very, very uncomfortable. They sort of jam it far, far up your nose. Um, that is most accurate eight days after exposure. It can be inaccurate if it's done too early or too late. Then there's the antigen test, also known as the rapid test. This test is not very accurate. This has a false negative rate of 30%. So what that means is 
30% of the time, the test tells you you do not have COVID when you do have COVID. So I wanna repeat that. 30% of the time, the rapid test tells you you do not have COVID when you do have COVID. Now, if the rapid test is positive, it's fairly accurate. We've discussed here before, sometimes both of these tests are negative and we have to send patients for a CAT scan of their chest. And that actually determines then that they're positive. Now, we've also talked about the sniffing dogs. The sniffing dogs are just as accurate as the PCR gold standard. Uh, some, uh, some countries are using them in their airports to help with airport travel. Um, just this past weekend, uh, it was used, they were used at a Miami heat game to screen, um, to screen the, uh, to screen the fans. So I think COVID sniffing dogs are something that we are going to see. Um, what happens is when they sniff and they smell COVID-19, then they sit down next to the person and then that person is then taken out of the line. All right, so let's talk about mask here. We've got our least favorite mask on the upper left-hand side, which is the fabric or cloth mask or handmade mask. Um, those can be about 20 or 30% effective. You've got the surgical mask. Those can be anywhere from 30 to 40% effective. Um, you can put a, um, a mask brace over them to actually make them more effective. Um, the best mask, which is down there to the left, is our KN95 mask. You can get those on Amazon. Uh, they are about 90% effective. And then the Spirian half respirator mask is what I use in the emergency department. That is an N100. And again, the 100 means it blocks out 100% of the particulate matter. Um, and that is what I actually use in the emergency department. Um, and I also used it when I had to, the one time I actually had to fly during the pandemic. All right, a lot of people talk about the fact that the masks are uncomfortable. I wanted to show a slide that actually shows how we actually put somebody on a ventilator. And this is actually what we do. We use this, this, this metal speculum, put it down your throat, increase your, lift up your tongue, and then actually put the actual plastic tube down. Um, and so I always tell people when they say a mask is uncomfortable, I say, well, a ventilator is more uncomfortable. So let's talk about the symptoms. There are six clusters of symptoms. Um, cluster one is flu-like without a fever. Cluster two is flu-like with a fever. And cluster three can actually almost seem like a stomach flu, vomiting, diarrhea, that sort of thing. Um, cluster one, two, and three um, are all basically self-limited and you can stay at home and do fine. Cluster four, five, and six are the ones that get admitted, go to the ICU, and often pass. So that is uh, uh, flu-like symptoms with fatigue, uh, flu-like symptoms with the development of confusion, or a combination of abdominal and respiratory symptoms. Now, all of these clusters are associated often with a loss of smell or a loss of taste, or even just a loss of appetite, but that's not a requirement. Now, in younger people, but I've seen this all the way up until about uh, 50 years old, you can get COVID toes. These are kind of a reddish bluish coloration of the toes. It makes uh, your toes look like maybe they got frostbitten or something. This is COVID until proven otherwise. We tell family members, please do not bring your children in with this. They do have COVID. And so if they're otherwise okay, they need to be at home. All right, let's talk a little bit about the long-term effects of COVID. Um, there's a lot of recovery for those that actually get out of the ICU. Uh, there is a syndrome called post-intensive care syndrome. About 75% of these patients um, have cognitive or mental or physical impairment. Some of them have renal failure and wind up on dialysis. Um, we're seeing a lot of limb amputations. Uh, there's a lot of strokes. Um, and the young folks with the strokes, about 50% of them cannot return to work. Um, and then we see a lot of scarring of the lungs um, and a lot of folks that about, about a third of them have problems walking a block or house cleaning because they get out of breath. Um, some of them actually get bad enough that they actually have to get a double lung transplant. Researchers have found that there is a higher concentration of coronavirus in the brain 
than in the lungs. And this is what we believe is actually causing some of the long haulers. So these are folks, no matter how, they could have been asymptomatic with COVID or symptomatic with COVID, it doesn't matter. But afterwards, they're having problems with their balance. Um, sometimes they're having problems uh, remembering things or um, actually being able to recall certain names uh, or definitions of things. Um, and so we believe that it's these higher concentrations of coronavirus in the brain that may play a role in what we call long haulers. All right, we talked about the flu and COVID are very, very different. The flu, about 40, not 10 to 45 million people per year. COVID-19, 26 million. However, more people and dramatically more people have died of COVID. So in one year, the highest number we've ever had of people die of the flu is about 90,000. With COVID-19, um, in 11 months, we're not up to a year yet. We're at 441,000. So it's 400% more people um, have died in 11 months of COVID than the flu. I also tell people COVID-19 is very distinct because we have to shut down all elective procedures or had to shut down all elective procedures in hospitals. Um, we have many hospitals where 100% of the ICU beds are COVID patients. Um, I've never seen where 100% of the ICU beds are flu patients. Um, in addition, we all know COVID-19 is not a respiratory disease. It's a multi-system disease. It impacts your kidneys, your heart, your brain, and your vascular system. Um, again, some people actually require a double lung transplant, and then some people actually require ECMO, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that is. All right, so if you're on this line and you just found out that you had COVID-19, the first thing I would say is preferably quarantine for 21 days because some people are still positive after 14 days. If you're able to actually get tested, that would be great. And you would need two tests separated by 24 hours to determine that you're negative. So if you turn, if you, if you find out that you're positive, the first thing you wanna do is get this little device off to the right here. This is a pulse ox. They're about $30 on Amazon. People get confused because there's two numbers on it. The first number is the number that's important. The number that says 97. That number should be 95 or above. You want to, you would be concerned when that number starts to drop below 95 if you're a healthy, normal person. The second number is just your pulse rate. Now, one thing that everybody should be doing during the pandemic is taking extra zinc and extra vitamin D3. I put the dosages up here. This makes a very big difference. You want to actually now take your zinc and your vitamin D3. Even if you're healthy, you think you'll never catch COVID, take some extra zinc, take some extra vitamin D3. If you're positive, you wanna make sure you have access to a bathroom that's only gonna be used by you. You wanna make sure you have a cell phone. Um, if you use that cell phone to call someone, you're gonna call 911. You're not gonna call a family or friend because if you call them, you're gonna give them COVID. You wanna make sure to leave food at the door. It's very important to open up the windows in your home if you're living with other people. Aeration makes a very, very big difference for COVID-19. If you find yourself in a bad situation, I did just the other day. I had someone jump in my car quickly without a mask on. I immediately rolled the windows down, right? And he was like, oh my gosh, it's cold. I said, well, it'll be warmer if you put your mask on. <laughs> So, so you want to make sure if you wind up in a situation where you there's people in the room or more people than you think or in your car, roll those windows all the way down. Um, all right. The other thing is you can put a HEPA filter uh, in your HVAC system. That is also make, will make a big difference in homes. All right. Let's talk about how do we treat COVID. So obviously we give them oxygen because their oxygen level is low. We talked about the vitamin D and the zinc. I'm going to talk about famotidine dexamethasone, the antibodies, and ECMO. Famotidine is Pepsid AC. This is something else to have in your house. Have Pepsid AC in your house. If somebody becomes COVID positive, then they need to take it. It's not because you have a stomach problem, it's because it blocks histamine. COVID-19 is an, in, an inflammatory disease. So what it does is it causes inflammation. 
Pepsidac blocks inflammation. So that's why you wanna have this in your home. It's been associated with lower deaths and lower combined death and intubations. Dexamethasone is a steroid. It also decreases inflammation and it lowers the 28 day death rate of patients who require oxygen or are on a ventilator. Regeneron, you hear people talk about Regeneron or Eli Lilly. This is the name of the company. This is not the name of the medication. So what happens when they're studying these medications, sometimes they have a, a number, the, the, the medications don't actually have a, a name to them sometimes. So Regeneron and Eli Lilly are just the name of the company. Um, and both of them have an antibody cocktail. And there's two antibodies in there. There's one from somebody, a human, that actually recovered from COVID-19. And the second is from an antibody of a mouse that was engineered to have a human-like immune system. That antibody binds to a region of the spike protein and it makes sure that it cannot attach to the receptor and get into the cell. And we'll show you what that looks like a little bit later. Eli Lilly's got emergency approval on November 10th. So you wanna know where are the infusion centers near you? If you had COVID, where, who would you call? What would you do? This just shows one of the screening tools of actually what it looks like for an infusion center. 65 years or older, anyone that has had symptoms within 10 days qualifies to actually get antibodies. So it's really important that you don't wait more than 10 days because after 10 days, the antibodies do not work. So if you're within 10 days, you're over 65, you need to immediately find an infusion center. Hopefully you've located them as a result of this presentation ahead of time and you know exactly where to go and what to do. If you're between 12 and 64 years old, then you would qualify if you had kidney disease or diabetes or, or some sort of immunosuppression treatment, or if you're overweight. Now, I want to actually, they use as a criteria a BMI of 35 or greater. I want to just be clear with people, it's not as overweight as you think. A BMI of 35 is somebody who's maybe 35, 35 or 40 pounds overweight. Now, what's very important about these antibodies is it decreases the likelihood of you being admitted by 70%. So this is an important stopgap and a lifesaver while we're waiting to get the vaccine. So know where those places are. All right, so let's talk about ECMO. ECMO stands for extra, meaning outside, corporal, meaning body, membrane, oxygenation, which is the, how the machine actually works. So what does it look like? This is what it looks like. It's literally a machine that's outside the patient's, uh, right next to the patient's bed. Um, we cannulate the vessel going into the heart and the one going out of the heart. It takes the blood out oxygenates it and puts it back into the body. So when a patient is on ECMO, this is a patient that has failed the ventilator. And often these patients will need a double lung transplant afterwards. All right, so a UK did a study and it showed that you have immunity for about three to five months. Um, so if you have recently had COVID-19, um, they're basically recommending you know, you don't have to necessarily get a, um, you don't have to get vaccinated within that 90 day period. Um, but after 90 days, you can catch COVID-19 again. These are two people who both caught COVID-19 twice. The woman on the left was 102. She caught COVID-19 twice and she's still living. The gentleman on the right, he's 18 years old. He caught COVID-19 twice and the second time he succumbed and passed. So we really don't know how this disease works in all different types of people. All right, so let's get to the vaccines because everybody wants to talk about the vaccine. So what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit first about how does it get into your cell. So the viral RNA are the light orange dots inside the darker orange. The darker orange is the fatty covering that covers the viral RNA. That fatty covering includes spike proteins, which are spiking off the surface of the particle. So those spike proteins connect with the receptor. As soon as they connect with the receptor protein, it unlocks your cell and it opens up your cell and allows the virus to actually come in. Then once your virus comes in, 
Then it actually, the RNA tells it make copies. So it makes copies and copies and copies and copies. It's during this copying process that mutations arise. So that's why the more the virus replicates, the more it is actually going to make better and better mutations. Better in that, um, better not better for us, but better for the virus. Because the virus is trying to live longer and trying to be around for longer. So it's gonna get smarter and smarter every time it copies. Okay? So then it actually reformulates and then it exits and it goes into another cell and it does that over and over and over again. So let's talk about what is RNA. There's lots of different types of RNA. I want people to know there's not just one. You hear people talk about messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is just one type and that is the type that actually tells the body to copy certain things. And so it basically turns the copying machine on. Now, how do the vaccines work? Moderna and Pfizer both work using a messenger RNA approach. What is important is messenger RNA has been around now for 30 years, it is not new. In fact, it's actually used in some chemotherapeutic drugs. But messenger RNA using it in a vaccine is the piece part of it that it actually is new. So what it does is it's coded for the spike protein. So when you get vaccinated, your body begins to produce the spike protein, not the virus, just the spike protein. Then your body recognizes the spike protein is foreign, develops antibodies and kills it. Then when you actually see COVID-19 in the real community, then what happens is you already have antibodies for it and you kill it. Now, some people say, I don't want messenger RNA. I don't like that technology. Well, then maybe the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is for you because it does not use messenger RNA. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine actually just today, right before we went live, Johnson & Johnson actually applied for emergency authorization in the United States. So they use a viral vector approach. So what is that? They take a virus and it happens to be the adenovirus, which is the, just the virus for the common cold. They make it harmless and add some genetic material from COVID-19. That combination teaches the body to generate antibodies to the spike protein. And again, it, it has your body prepared because you've got antibodies. And then when you see it in the future, you're actually prepared, you have the antibodies and you can fight it. Now, this just shows a little bit about the different uh, efficacy, how does it work, how many doses, et cetera, storage. So I wanted to just go over a couple of things. Um, most people have heard a lot about the Moderna and the Pfizer. When it looks, when you look at um, how well they work, I just want to point out Johnson & Johnson has the lowest number, but Johnson & Johnson is the only one on this list that actually did their study during in South Africa when the South African variant was at its highest. So that number is really um, a little artificially low, or it actually tells you that there is some protection from that South African uh, variant. Um, all of them are two doses, except for the Johnson & Johnson, and they all have similar side effects like flu-like symptoms, fatigue, chills. Now, people say, why do we get that? Because again, you're simulating this, you're simulating this in your, your body's response, immune response. And so when your body actually fights an infection, and that's when your, your body actually gets chills, fatigue, fever, et cetera. Most people don't have to take a day off from work. It normally is something that subsides. Uh, I had some people ask me for the raw data. This is what the raw data looks like. Pfizer did 37,000 people, average age of 51. 21% of them were over 65. You can see the ethnic breakdown there. The people who were in the placebo group, that's the people who just got you know, a, a shot of saline. They didn't get the vaccine. There was 162 cases. For those that actually got the vaccine, there were eight. Severe cases of COVID in the people who did not get the vaccine was three, and those that were vaccinated, it was one. When you look at Moderna, very similar, 30,000 participants, average age of 51, similar ethnic makeup. Um, there were 185 cases of COVID in the people who did not get the vaccine, 30 severe cases. If you got vaccinated, only 11, 
and no, not a single severe case of COVID. There's this whole framework for equitable allocation of the vaccine. Just don't even worry about it. CDC has already said everyone over 65 should be getting the vaccine right now, as well as frontline workers and teachers and medical workers. Now, DC is doing something that I think is very, very, very important. DC is actually prioritizing people that are overweight. Um, the death rate amongst uh, folks that are overweight is significantly higher. Um, and obesity is a significant, one of the most significant risk factors for COVID-19. So um, Washington DC is the first, uh, first uh, city that I know of or even state that has um, decided to prioritize those that are overweight. Now everybody says all these vaccines are actually getting uh, uh, approved. I don't think they're really looking at them real quickly and looking at them too thoroughly. Well, Merck actually had two vaccines that actually did not, did not make, uh, did not make the cut. Um, this past Monday, they stopped the development of two of their vaccines um, because uh, it, they were not having the results uh, that they needed to have. Now, let's go over quickly mutations. We are not actually doing the genomic surveillance that we need to do, so we don't know to what extent these mutations are in the United States, but we know that they are here, or we assume that they are here. They're basically the UK variant, which is 70% more infectious. People are coming in with a much, much higher viral load, but the, the mutation is kind of minor. The South African variant actually has a large amount of alteration to the spike protein, it is really more likely, it is the most likely variant to escape um, either treatment or antibodies or, or uh, vaccination. Um, it seems to be also a very uh, much more dangerous for children or young people. Um, there's also the Brazilian variant and the California variant. Altogether, dosing wise, we have distributed 50, almost 56 million doses and administered 33 million close to 34. Just take a look here with this slide. This actually shows what has happened in the UK um, just in the time that they actually were able to um, uh, give the first dose. So as you see this, the, um, the two different um, lines there, it sort of shows how this really dampens the, epi uh, the epidemic. Um, we're already seeing decreased hospitalizations in a lot of hospitals um, and certainly within the next four to six weeks, we'll see a major, uh, a major, major difference. And, and hopefully at least the hospital system can get back to normal, uh, hopefully by March or April. Mass vaccinations are gonna play a major, major role. Um, you know, they're using um, large stadiums, large convention centers, um, so they can uh, do um, hundreds of people in a day. Um, we're right now up around 1.5 million people a day. Um, I think we can easily get to two or three million people a day when the retail pharmacies come into play. So how do I get my vaccine now? What do I do? So the main thing is you go to your county public health department right now since the retail pharmacies don't have it yet. So you just Google the name of your county and the public health department. Then you go to the search icon and put COVID vaccine. And then there'll be a website that will come up and you look for instructions. Um, you may need to call the public health department and say, where, send me the link. Where do I actually make an appointment? Um, so it's not the easiest uh, to navigate, but this is actually what we have to do now to actually get the vaccine. You can also, if you have Medicare Advantage um, or an HMO or something like that, many of those plans if you call them, um, we'll actually uh, set up something for you. And some of them are actually being very proactive in coming out to people's homes. All right, so get your vaccine now. Here we've got, a, we've got some new photos. Uh, please make sure to send me a photo from anyone in this community that's actually getting vaccinated so we can put your photo on our collage board. As we, get, uh, as we get people vaccinated, we'd love to add your photo. 
Now, lastly, uh, General Tedros uh, from the World Health Organization really um, stresses the importance that this will not be our last pandemic. And it's really important that we as countries worldwide um, create ways to actually work together. We're all in this together. Um, one infection is clearly an infection anywhere and everywhere. Um, and how do we actually really work together so that in the future, we can, um, we can pick these infections up quickly, stamp them out quickly, and work together um, across the spectrum of nationalities and countries um, to keep people safe. All right, that is the presentation. We're gonna go to Q&A.